Order. Senator Wong, questions without notice. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann, and I refer to the national accounts release today. Can the Minister confirm Australia has plunged into the worst recession since the Great Depression almost a century ago? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Th 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 thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, today is a very hard day for Australia. And uh, you know, many, many Australians have gone through a very difficult period over the last six or seven months uh, as a result of a once-in-a-century global pandemic. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic has hit economies around the world very hard. It has hit the Australian economy very hard, and it has had a devastating impact on, livelihoods of, on the livelihoods of too many, too many Australians. And I'm, I'm disappointed that the flavour of the interjections from the opposition again demonstrates the level of political sneering that, quite frankly, comple completely. I mean, the, the Labour Party again tries to suggest that there's no context to what is happening here. We, we are where we are as a direct result of the coronavirus pandemic. This we have to Order die enter into the COVID-19 recession. Left. That is, that is a very Senator sad Keneally. day for Australia, but that is the reality of it. And I know that the Labor Party doesn't want to hear this. As bad as things are, as bad as things are for Australia, we went into this period in a stronger position than others. We have gone through this period in a stronger position than others. And the impact on our economy Order, uh, is, is much less severe than what it has been in other parts of the world. The United Kingdom has experienced a contraction of more than 20 per cent in one quarter. More than 20 per cent. Again, Ayers. it's the sort of inconvenient truth that the uh, Labour Party is not interested in. The Labour Party just wants to come into this, into this chamber, uh, pursue a biased political strategy, using, using this tragedy which is caused by an external event that is beyond our control as a way to score party political points. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should be absolutely Order. ashamed of yourself. The Australian people can see what you're doing. We know why we're here. The Australian people know why we're here. And we know what Order. we need to Senator do to continue Coleman, to guide time Australia the out answer of this has crisis. Inspired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. National accounts released today show that the economy has contracted by 7 per cent. Can the minister confirm this is the worst quarterly result since records began, plunging Australia into the first recession in three decades and ending 29 years of continuous economic growth? Senator Cormann. Uh, yes. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. With the worst recession since the Great Depression almost a century ago and the worst quarterly contraction since records began, can the minister explain why the government has no plan for jobs and no plan for economic recovery? Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr President. That is a ridiculous proposition, and I completely Order. and utterly reject the Senator, premise of the Senators question. Watt and I completely Keneally. and utterly reject the premise of the question. As soon as this crisis Order. hit, as soon as this crisis hit, our government not only made decisions to protect the health of our fellow Australians, we also made decisions to support the economy, to support jobs. We have provided unprecedented, unprecedented levels of crisis level fiscal support into the economy, uh, trying, trying to uh, save as many businesses as possible, making sure that as many businesses as possible survive through this period, that as many jobs as possible are saved through this period, and indeed to ensure that as many Australians as possible remain connected to their employer. And of course we are making decisions to encourage businesses to invest in their future success uh, through our uh, tax Order. savings and, and, Senator and indeed, uh, through, Senator our, through our skills agenda. And indeed, uh, you know, Senator, Senator Cash is, of course, a very uh, effective minister pursuing our skills and training agenda. Uh, through our, through Senator our, Cormann, our policies time to for the answer prices. has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the minister further update the Senate on the economic challenges facing Australia as a result of the global coronavirus pandemic. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, the National Accounts released today uh, show what Australians already knew. Our economy has been hit hard, very hard, by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Australian economy contracted by 7 per cent in the June quarter, uh, which is uh, indeed the largest quarterly fall in real GDP on record since records were kept. This was driven by large drops in household consumption, dwelling investment and business investment. Mr. President, the largest contributors to the decline in consumption were hotels, cafes and restaurants, 
which were down 56.1 per cent, and transport services, which were down 85.9 per cent, a staggering 85.9 per cent. But, Mr. President, the numbers today show that Australia is performing comparatively well when compared to other countries around the world facing precisely the same challenge. The IMF, uh, is, the IMF is expecting that 157 economies will contract this year with unprecedented falls in many. COVID-19 has been a wrecking ball through the global economy. The impact in the June quarter has been staggering, with GDP falling by 20.4 per cent in the UK, 13.8 per cent in France, 11.5 per cent in Canada, and 9.1 per cent in the United States. Mr. President, the decisions our government made prior Order. to this crisis improved our budget Order. position by more than $250 billion over the 10 years to 22-23. That put us on a better, more sustainable fiscal trajectory for the future as we went into this crisis and has enabled us to provide Order record levels left. of crisis-level support into the economy, to business and to working families. If we had not done what we have done in our first six years in government, we would have had less fiscal capacity to respond and our economy would have been less resilient Order and today our economy would have been weaker. Left. It is because we repaired Labour's mess in our first six years in government that Australia is in a better position today than we Order, otherwise would Senator have been. Corman. Order on my left. Order. I will call Senator Brockman when I can hear him. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, Minister, can you inform the Senate how the government's historic level of support is helping Australians on our road to economic recovery? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Brockman for that question. Uh, Mr. President, as I've said, we came into this uh, crisis in a stronger, more resilient position as a result of the budget repair work done by our government during our first six years in government. That allowed us to commit to $314 billion worth of support for the Australian economy, nearly 16 per cent of GDP. Nearly 16 per cent of GDP. According to Treasury, that support has helped save 700,000 jobs. 700,000 jobs. Watt. The unemployment rate would have been around Senator 5 per cent higher Senator than it is today. Senator Birmingham. Senator Birmingham and Senator Watt. Before I call Senator Wong, I will insist on both of you being quiet. Senator Wong, on a point of order. He did. I heard what he called him. I'd ask him to withdraw. I, I'm afraid I, I did not. There was so much. There was order, Senator Wong, please. There was complete disorder across the chamber. I was struggling to hear Senator Cormann. Um, order. I'm going to ask you, Senator McGrath, to withdraw that. Um, well, uh, Senator. Um, 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 I did not hear it. I can't attest to it. Um, what is conventional in these opportunities is if a senator wishes to withdraw a comment, they may, but I cannot order a withdrawal for something I did not hear. I'm going to ask Senator McGrath to withdraw the comment he made. I, I, I heard that one. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oh, no, sorry, President. Senator Birmingham is seeking Pre a call. Sorry. Uh, President, I stand by the question asking which planet, Senator, what's been on all year, but if I said that, I withdraw it. Thank you. Senator Cormann, please continue. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr. President. Yeah, I've got to say that's a very good uh, point by Senator Birmingham, that question that is just raised. Because, I mean, and, but Senator Watt is not. He is certainly not uh, Robinson Crusoe, because everyone on that uh, island that is called the Labour Party these days uh, is in complete denial of what is actually happening on planet Earth. I mean, here, here, is, here is a message from Order, planet Senator Earth. Corman, Senator time for the answer has expired. I will call Senator Brockman when there is silence. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister for that answer. Minister. Can you inform the Senate how the government is giving employers the flexibility they need to keep workers employed while they fight back from this economic shock? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much. And this is, of course, another important part of our plan for, uh, to protect jobs during this pandemic. Mr. President, the temporary JobKeeper provisions in the Fair Work Act have provided essential flexibility that has been vital for struggling businesses to survive the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and keep their employees in jobs. It allows employers receiving the wage subsidy to make key changes to their operations. These include adjusted employee work hours, uh, 
altering duties or the location of work. Uh, while this support will be essential for businesses that remain eligible for JobKeeper, greater workforce, uh, workplace flexibility will also be vitally important for many businesses that no longer qualify for JobKeeper post-September. This will allow those businesses to keep as many of their employees as possible as they continue to recover from the worst of the crisis. And of course, again, the Labour Party is not interested in everything that is being done to protect jobs. They just want to pursue biased political uh, attacks uh, Order, from, from a different Senator planet. Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann, today the National Accounts confirm that we're in the deepest recession since the Great Depression almost a century ago. We've recorded the worst quarterly contraction of 7 per cent since records began. Isn't this the worst time for the Prime Minister to be cutting JobKeeper, cutting JobSeeker, cutting wages and freezing the pension? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Senator Gallagher is uh, mixing up a whole range of different things here. Let, let me just Order. say, Senator when it White. comes— when it, comes, when, it, when, it comes to, when it comes to the uh, pension, the pension will continue to rise in line with inflation. In line with inflation. In line with inflation. We have not, we have not made any decisions whatsoever. We have not made any decisions whatsoever to change the uh, indexation arrangements for the pension. And I think that that question, the way you're framing it, and the way you seek to scare vulnerable Australians, is very dishonest indeed. When it comes to job people, of course we need to uh, phase out of these. Uh, historically unprecedented transitional crisis level support arrangements. That is what none other than Mr Albanese used to say in May, June, July. I mean, he was on the record saying we've got to phase out this uh, historically unprecedented level of support. He's right, because we need, we, need to allow, we need to allow the economy to adjust so that it can get into the new normal and start growing again from the new baseline. That is what we need to do, Mr President. Quite frankly, we were hit with a crisis. We needed to pause and put in place all of the appropriate support mechanisms. But now, moving forward, we've got to allow the economy to transition out of the crisis uh, into the new normal. And for those businesses which have the opportunity to be successful, viable and profitable into the future, to have the best possible opportunity to, to succeed, that is why we are pursuing, again, our pro-growth agenda, which the Australian people voted for before the last election. That is why we're providing Order tax incentives left. to business uh, to encourage them to invest more in their future success so that growing businesses will hire more Australians. That's why we're pursuing an ambitious free trade agenda, giving our exporting businesses better access to markets around the world, lower prices, lower electricity prices, better skills and training, uh, and indeed less regulation, uh, faster approvals uh, for our projects uh, so, that we, so that we can ensure we get more projects and more jobs off the ground. I mean, these are all the things that we are doing and will continue to do uh, to create more jobs Order, and better opportunities. Senator Cormann. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. The national accounts show that the household spending levels collapsed in the June quarter, demonstrating their lack of confidence in the economy. Why is the government reducing support to households now at a time when they clearly require it? Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much. So in one of my earlier answers, I pointed oh, out Senator, that consumption levels had dropped, in particular in cafes, restaurants, travel. Now, a message to, from planet Earth again. You know, governments around Australia imposed restrictions. Restaurants were not allowed to open. Like restaurants were not allowed to open. Cafes were not allowed to open. Planes were not allowed to fly. Like, I mean, what do you expect would happen in that context? What do you expect would happen in that Order. context? Like, I mean, Order. I mean, like. I, honestly, I mean, on even on planet Mars, people would understand that. I think even on planet Mars, they would understand that when you have a global pandemic Senator that Watts. requires restrictions and which which uh, prohibits restaurants from opening, cafes from opening, planes to fly, well then Senator that will Gallagher. have an impact on the consumption in relation to those areas. I mean, of course that. I mean, that is absolutely. Order. Uh, logical. The only people that don't seem to understand the context of the global COVID-19 pandemic is the Australian Labor Party. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a order, Senator Wong. I'd like to hear Senator Gallagher. I do question. have a, a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Wait, the government's decision this week to cut JobKeeper, cut JobSeeker, cut wages, freeze the pension make the worst recession in almost a century even deeper and even longer than it needs to be. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, Mr President. So, I mean, we now have Senator Gallagher criticising legislation she voted for. Legislation she voted for. Like, I mean, so, so, so here, here we are. 
Senator or Senator Keneally, Senator Wong's on his feet on a point of order. Mr. President, I know this minister doesn't want to answer the question. He has continued to talk about the opposition. Order. Can I hear the point of order? You're reducing well, it, Dan. We, 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 the, the senator asked a question about the minister's decision this week. He wants to talk about Senator Gallagher and her voting record. There's plenty of other opportunities for him to do so. But he was asked a direct question on this, and I ask him to return to the question. Um, uh, order. Um, Order. Oh, we, won't, we won't get through many questions if this gets up. Okay. Order. I mean, this is time that the opposition. This is. We'll just sit here and waste time. I'll rule. I don't think this is. You know. We're on broadcast. I don't think this is a particularly good example for the Senate. Order. On the point of order, the question was very broad. The minister was eight seconds in. Uh, the point raised by Senator Wong and interjections supporting Senator Wong um, were matters for debate. They, in my view, I cannot rule the minister being um, the minister is being directly relevant, particularly as he was eight seconds in. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We stand by the legislation that we put to the Senate and which the Labor Party supported. Order. And we absolutely and we absolutely stand by the decisions that we have made. And Order. Senator, Senator Wong is actually, actually not interested in answers. She's just interested Order. in Senator disorderly Wong. interjecting. Senator Wong, Mr. please. I, I need to be able to hear Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann. So, uh, Mr. President, uh, we will continue to implement our plan for the strongest possible economic and jobs recovery, the strongest possible economic and jobs Order. recovery, and and phasing out phasing out the uh, level of job keeper wage subsidy uh, as the economy recovers. Over, a, you know, essentially at the end of a 12-month period of historically unprecedented support is part of that. We need to allow businesses to adjust. We need to allow the economy to adjust so that we can maximise the strength of the recovery uh, on the other side. Senator Faruqi, order. Order. Can I please hear Senator Faruqi? Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to the minister representing the Minister for Education. Minister, happy Early Childhood Educators Day, but perhaps not so happy for the educators. The United Workers Union has come to Parliament today to meet with the Education Minister and deliver a petition of more than 30,000 signatures. The petition calls for the federal government to provide a wage guarantee to workers in early childhood education and care throughout COVID-19. The union says that the employment guarantee provided by the government doesn't prevent part-time staff and casuals from facing drastic cuts in hours. The vast majority of the sector is part-time or casual. They are among the lowest paid workers in Australia. Why won't the government commit to a wage guarantee for our critical early childhood educators and carers? The Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Faruqi for her question. And, uh, and I do acknowledge that uh, early childhood education providers, uh, carers, uh, educators uh, across the country uh, provide uh, an essential and very important service to many, many families uh, and an important and essential educational opportunity and benefit uh, to many young Australians. Uh, my own children uh, received outstanding care and early childhood education uh, from wonderful carers, and I'm sure that is the case for many others uh, in this chamber. Uh, and we acknowledge their hard work, uh, the care they provide, uh, and the foundational start that they give uh, to young Australians in terms of their education and well-being. Uh, it's why our government has been pleased to expand opportunity and access uh, for families to be able to reach early childhood education and care services, and that we see record numbers of children and families accessing those services uh, as we entered the pandemic uh, this year. Uh, we value the work of those carers uh, who, of course, have uh, their wages determined through standard industrial relations processes. Uh, as indeed uh, do uh, all Australians as part of the uh, award system there. Uh, but increasingly, we have pleasingly seen the number of children accessing the valuable care services there grow, increasing some 1.8 per cent last year to uh, 1,339,970 uh, over that period of time. 
number of families increasing as well. Uh, and that growth is a testament to the fact that uh, under our government, pre-pandemic, uh, our childhood education reforms had provided uh, for uh, families to be able to access uh, care uh, with support from the government for those who needed uh, the most hours of support, getting the most amount of hours subsidised care, uh, for those earning the least and uh, getting the greatest rate of subsidy under our reforms, uh, and that helped drive more families Order. into Senator a system Birmingham. to receive such care. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, we are seeing growing enthusiastic support across our community for universally available early learning. Just this week, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner identified an overhaul of childcare as a key priority for women's equality. And research from the ANU and Grattan Institute has shown the huge benefits of greater public investment in early learning. When will the government admit that the current system is broken and commit to fee-free, well-funded early learning for all families? Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, we won't uh, we won't admit that because we don't agree that's the case. In fact, uh, our belief is that our reforms have strengthened uh, the current system. Uh, our reforms saw investment grow, uh, investment forecast to be around nine billion dollars a year in relation uh, to the Australian government's support for funding early childhood education and care services, growing to ten billion dollars a year over the next few years. And this is significant rate of growth and expenditure in these areas. Uh, and in the growth of expenditure, what we have done is make sure that we target that expenditure so that, as I said before, under the reforms our government enacted, families who can least afford care receive the greatest level of subsidy and support to access that care. Indeed, the most vulnerable families receive an entire subsidy. All fees are paid and covered in those circumstances. And those working the longest hours receive the greatest entitlement to subsidy, whilst guaranteed hours are there for children in relation to Order. their preschool access. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Mr President, Minister, the Thrive by Five campaign for universal access to early learning launched this week, with everyone from Michelle O'Neill and Jay Wetherill to Julie Bishop and Nicola Forrest saying universal early learning is a great idea. Why is the government dragging its heels and refusing again and again to commit to making our childcare system universally accessible? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, our childcare system is universally accessible. Uh, it is universally accessible on a range of levels. Firstly, in terms of the provision uh, of preschool opportunity uh, for children, where our government has continuously worked with the states and territories. Uh, to ensure that there is universal access and right to attend preschool services. And not only that, but we continue to try to work with the states and territories to better benchmark attendance at those preschool services. Far too often, far too often the reports we get back are about enrolment in preschool, but fail to address the gap in attendance, where often the most vulnerable children who will most benefit from attendance are the ones least likely to be attending. Uh, and the work that our government has sought to do has been to engage states and territories to try to ensure the funding we provide for the delivery of those preschool services gets to the children who need it most uh, and delivers them the support that they deserve in terms of being at childcare, being at preschool and getting that Order. educational Senator opportunity Birmingham. that they will benefit Senator from. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's record economic response of over $300 billion to the COVID-19 pandemic is keeping small businesses in business and their employees in work through the economic effects of the pandemic? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McGrath for the question. And, Mr. President, as the uh, Minister for Finance has stated, uh, COVID-19, a global pandemic, has had a devastating impact uh, on not only the global economy but, of course, the Australian economy. When a government has to shut down parts of the economy, uh, it is going to have a detrimental effect, and we know that it has had a devastating effect on many small and family businesses around Australia. But that is why the government took decisive action and continues to take decisive action to respond to both the health aspects of the pandemic but of course the economic aspects and in terms of our support for small and family businesses up uh, they are the engine room 
of the Australian economy. Uh, they support, in particular, rural and regional economies around Australia. And that is why we are investing a record stimulus of in excess of $300 billion into the economy to ensure Senator that uh, we can support them. Mr President, when Senator you Watt. look at the support that is actually flowing through order. to small Senator, businesses— Senator Cormann, yeah, on the point of order, uh, th Michael, you what I was about to say. Like, um, interjections are always disorderly, even more so when uh, there is total disregard uh, to uh, interventions by the president. I'm going to revert to my rule of asking people to count slowly to 10 after they're called to order. Um, particularly those who have been particularly voluble today, Senator Watt. Senator Cash, to continue. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And Order. Senator Watt. Um, well, if someone has been as voluble as Senator Watt, they probably need to learn a little bit of patience. I've, I've called him out more than anyone else today. I will call those to my right to order in a minute. But Goose and Gander is also when I've called Senator Watt more than a dozen times in 25 minutes, uh, he can bite his tongue. People shouldn't bait those who are known to have short fuses either. But please, if I call you to order, at least show some respect to the chair and your colleagues by not continuing it immediately. Order across the chamber. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And the economic support is flowing through to small and family business around Australia. Uh, in terms of the JobKeeper payment, uh, we know that it is supporting around 3.5 million Australians to maintain that really important connection with their employer. Uh, and certainly, yesterday, legislation passed this place that will ensure that that support now continues through until March next year. In terms of the cash flow boost, that is also flowing through to small and family businesses around Australia. They are now accessing over $24 billion in a Assistance, and that's over 785,000 businesses. That important money flowing through back to them. In terms of the apprentice wage subsidy, it's now supporting at this time over 51,200 employers, mostly small businesses around Australia, to retain almost 90,000 apprentices and trainees. Small and family businesses, they are the backbone of the Australian economy, and the Morrison government Order, will continue Senator Cash. to support them. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. How has the government's strong record of supporting small business created the conditions for economic recovery on the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, uh on the government side of the chamber, on the coalition side of the chamber, we understand that putting in place policies that will support small and family businesses to prosper, grow, to create more jobs uh, for Australians is essential for a strong economy. And we've had a record of that since we're elected to government. In particular, though, fast-tracking tax relief for small and family uh, businesses around Australia, because we know that it's their money. The more that we can give back to them, uh, the more that they can invest back into their businesses and create more jobs for Australians. Uh, but of course, ensuring small businesses are paid on time through a range of initiatives, but in particular, including the government's own payment policies. Cutting red tape for small business. Red tape uh, is a blocker in terms of job creation, and we are absolutely committed to cutting red tape where we can, uh, but also investing in mental health resources for small businesses are uh, so important given the devastating impact of COVID-19 on the Order. economy. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. How will the government's job maker plan support small businesses to create jobs and support their communities as the economy recovers from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr. President, the Morrison government understands uh, small and family businesses, the backbone of the Australian economy. We understand that we need to, and we have put in place policies that will enable them to prosper, grow, and create more jobs for Australians. And in terms of our plan for economic recovery to get Australia and Australians through COVID-19, uh, every minister, every department, uh, they are working to put job creation at the centre of everything we do. We will continue to build on the measures that we have already implemented to help the economy and ensure that small businesses are able to create jobs. And as the Minister for Finance has stated, this includes undertaking important skills reform, ensuring that Australians are skilled uh, in areas of the economy that are creating jobs, the important industrial relations reform that the Minister for Finance uh, referred to, removing unnecessary red tape through deregulation, 
and, of course, streamlining project approvals, Order. a key Senator factor Cass, in job creation. Expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Cormann. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott gets two taxpayer-funded staff members, a driver, an office, a private vehicle, free travel and a pension worth over $300,000 a year. Mr Abbott has accepted our role advancing the interests of a foreign nation. This is a strong probability that Mr Abbott will be employed to assist the UK negotiate trade deals that may not necessarily benefit Australia's sovereign interest. Is the Prime Minister really going to allow Australian taxpayers to pay him, pay for his office, pay for his travel, pay for his staff and pay for his car while he's working against the interests of the same Australian taxpayers that are covering his bills? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President, uh, and I thank Senator Lambie for that question. I'm somewhat disappointed that a Labor senator felt it appropriate to say that that was a good question, because in Australia we have a, a great tradition in a non-partisan fashion to treat our former prime ministers with respect from both, from both sides of politics, from both sides of politics, Order. and the and the and the work expenses available to former prime ministers, be they Order Labor on my or left. Liberal, are precisely the same and organised in an entirely non-partisan fashion. Order on my left. I'm fashion. having trouble hearing. Me, Senator Coleman, can you please resume your seat? Senator, this, this is no reflection on Senator Cormann. I can't hear what he's saying. Really? When I say I can't hear a minister answering a question, the retort to the chair is he should answer the question. I'm asking to be able to hear the minister answer the question. He does not have a small, a, a quiet voice, and I can't hear it. Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, Mr. President. And, you know, despite my voice, I don't think any of my colleagues uh, are falling asleep as I'm answering this question today. But, Mr. Mr. President, um, we, we treat our former prime ministers with respect, with courtesy and respect. The uh, work expense arrangements for all of them are the same. I believe that all of them, uh, all of them pursue, all of them pursue uh, alternative um, uh, co opportunities to contribute internationally and domestically. Uh, I don't believe that. Uh, I, I, I don't believe the information that uh, Sir Lambie has that uh, Mr. Abbott is uh, uh, paid for. Uh, work that he uh, is uh, conducting to facilitate international trade. Uh, I don't believe he's paid for that role. Uh, I, I don't think it is appropriate uh, to make the sorts of reflections that were supported by a, a Labor senator in this chamber, disappointingly, uh, in relation to any of our former prime ministers. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Whether he was paid or not, I was kicked out of the Senate in 2017 under Section 44 for dual citizenship. The thinking has always been that dual citizens have dual, alliance, dual allegiance to Australia and to another country. If another country was paying me to promote, promote their interests, potentially over the interests of Australia, would that be considered a dual allegiance? And if so, would I, like Mr Abbott, still be entitled to an annual salary from the taxpayer? Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, Mr President. Firstly, uh, Mr Abbott is no longer a member of uh, the uh, Australian Parliament, so the constitutional arrangements around eligibility for federal members of parliament do not apply to Mr uh, Abbott. Uh, Mr Abbott, like any uh, former uh, member of parliament, any former prime minister under the old uh, parliamentary pension arrangements, uh, you know, obviously, uh, qualifies for the arrangements that have been in place for all on the same basis. I think it's entirely inappropriate to make uh, the suggestions that are being uh, made here. Uh, I, I, I think it is, I think it is uh, deeply personal and inappropriate. And uh, Senator Wong, no. Well, Senator Wong, uh, quite frankly, everyone after their leave is entitled to pursue other career opportunities and the, and the retirement order, income Senator arrangements Coleman, are the same for Senator Lambie. On a point of order, Senator Lambie? Yeah, um, my point of order is, could you please, uh, what I'm asking you is, do you not, do you not think that um, that gives him a dual allegiance. We are paying him, yet he's, he may be going S into Lambie, trade please. to come against Senator the Lambie, taxpayer. I've allowed you to restate part of the question, but that was not a point of order. I think the, I think the, minister, I think the minister is being directly relevant to the question as asked. Even, there's a chance to debate it later. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you. I answered the question directly. I mean, the analogy that Senator Lambie sought to make with uh, her circumstance uh, when uh, she found herself in breach of constitutional eligibility requirements is not there because Mr uh, Abbott is no longer a member of the Australian Parliament. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What would the Prime Minister like to say to the thousands of veterans 
whose compensation claims that have been denied in the courts every year, each mounting to far less than $700,000 a year, we're paying a former Prime Minister to work against Australia's national interest, have to say. Senator Corbyn. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I'm, I'm disappointed that Senator Lambie chooses to uh, pick on one former Prime Minister. The arrangements are the same for uh, all of our current former Prime Ministers, except the most recent ones. And, um, and, and anyone who has, well, I mean, Senator Wong, if you are suggesting that we should change retirement income arrangements retrospectively, then please say so and move a piece of legislation along those lines. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister outline how the recent agreement between the United States Defence Department and the Australian company Linus to supply critical minerals from its Mount Weld mine in Western Australia will benefit Australia? The minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Canavan for his question. Of course, uh, a consistent advocate for Australia's resources industry, as the entire chamber knows. Linus is uh, an Australian-listed company and a great Aussie success and export success story. It is a key component of the global rare earth supply chain and, I understand, supplies around 13 per cent uh, of global rare earth element production. Uh, Linus owns and operates a rare earths mine in Mount World, West WA. Uh, and ore from Mount World is shipped and processed at Linus's Advanced Materials Plant in Malaysia. On 27 July 2020, Linus announced that the US Department of Defence and Linus had signed a contract for Phase 1 work to deliver a US-based heavy rare earths processing facility. But this, I'm pleased to say, Mr President, uh, is not Linus's only facility development. Linus is also investing around $500 million to build a processing plant in Kalgoorlie to use Mount World ore. Linus is committed to using a residential workforce instead of FIFO workers, grading about 500 jobs in the construction phase and about 100 permanent roles. Linus is a proven record in the processing of rare earth elements, and this is an important milestone in delivering more diversified global supply of heavy rare earths. Critical minerals featured again in the recent Osmin consultations held by my colleagues in Washington. This highlighted the importance of work Australia and the US are progressing to diversify critical mineral supply chains. The current COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted potential issues associated with concentrated supply chains, but we know that Australia is well placed to lead the diversification of critical mineral supply chains across the globe, as we are the leading producer of some of the world's most sought after critical minerals, including rare earths, lithium, zirconium and titanium. These are critical minerals found in our phones, laptops, advanced technological products and, of course, across defence industries as well. That's why we're so committed to working Order, with Senator our partners Birmingham. to help Time diversify for the that supply. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, why is it important for our mining and manufacturing sectors uh, to deliver uh, diverse export markets? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, Australia's resource industry is, uh, is world-leading. The world needs our raw materials and mining, and we have been a proud, consistent and reliable supplier of such minerals right across the world in terms of support uh, for growth of others. Australia is the world's largest producer of iron ore, of metallurgical coal, of LNG, of bauxite and the second largest producer of gold and thermal coal. Australia also has extensive resources of nickel, copper and zinc, metals which will be the key for the future economy. We are increasingly looking and working with companies like Linus in the value adding to our resources. Our mining engineering technology and services industry is world leading, exporting itself around $27 billion worth of Australian know-how and expertise to support resources projects across the globe. Now, Australia has many robust trading partners. We export our resources to many of the world's major economies, meeting their demands, their needs, but in doing so creating jobs and opportunities for Order. Australians Senator and Australian Birmingham. businesses to Senator grow. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, how will, Minister, how will expanding our minerals exports to nations like the United States help secure long-term, well-paying jobs in regional Australia uh, on our road to economic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the resources industry is one of the most important industries for regional communities. Regional communities right across Australian states, including, of course, Senator Canavan's great home state of Queensland. But whether it's from Karratha to Mackay or Mount Isa across Queensland or right across the country, 
The resources sector underpins good jobs, reliable jobs, high-paying jobs for families, particularly those living in regional areas, and it creates economies and communities that provide further job opportunities right across regional Australia. It is, of course, also, uh, I am pleased to say as Trade Minister, uh, our leading export sector in terms of the contribution it makes generating income wealth for our nation, as I was saying before, not just in the extraction of resources, increasingly in areas of processing and in the use of Australian skills, know-how and capabilities that we see now assisting projects around the world and again generating more high-paying job opportunities for Australians, which Order. will be Senator ever Birmingham. more important in our Senator, economic recovery. We're going to the screen now. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is also to Senator Birmingham, representing the Minister for Resources. Senator Birmingham, last week the New South Wales Liberal member for McKellar, Jason Felinski, called on the House to oppose oil and gas drilling off the coast of Sydney and oppose the renewal of the Petroleum Exploration Permit PEP 11 licence. Does the, is the federal government aware of the reasons the member of McKellar doesn't want to see new oil and gas exploration off the New South Wales coastline? And do your, does your government agree with Mr Felinski? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, and I thank Senator Wish Wilson for the question. Uh, I did not uh, see Senator Flin uh, Mr Felinski's comments. He's welcome to the Senate uh, if he wishes, but he does a fine job in his electorate uh, already. Um, I did not see Mr Felinski's uh, uh, comments. Uh, so I'll take, uh, take on notice any details in relation to that that might be necessary to add. Uh, but what I would, uh, would make uh, the point of uh, is that we have well-established approvals processes in relation to oil and gas exploration, uh, where that is, uh, is offshore, uh, working through uh, NOPSEMA, uh, an agency that, uh, that has had its expertise and credibility demonstrated time and again, uh, most recently, in fact, uh, by work that Australia's chief scientist did following the last election. Uh, to, uh, to review NOPSEMA uh, in terms of their approvals processes uh, and to ensure that the way in which uh, they assess or environmental risks and other factors uh, occurs in a most thorough manner. Senator West Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. The permit holders of PEP 11, Asset Energy and Bounty Oil and Gas, want to go straight from seismic testing to drilling, a change of permit that would require and skip community consultation. Given the New South Wales Liberal government also opposes any extension to PEP 11 and the ultimate decision rests with the federal minister, will your government listen to your federal and state colleagues rather than a few oil and gas interests and step in to protect the New South Wales coastline from a potentially deadly oil spill and a divisive Order. industrial Senator Wilson, development? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, I can say that what our government will do uh, is not listen to a few interests be they on any side of any one debate, but that we will apply the law fully, thoroughly, rigorously, as it's intended to be. Uh, we will let our independent agencies who operate under laws passed through this parliament undertake the assessments of any applications for permits, changes in permits or otherwise uh, be conducted uh, without any political interference, uh, but on the basis of the merits uh, of those cases including, of course, the thorough and proper environmental consideration that will be given to any such applications or requests. Senator Bush Wilson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. Minister, there's little to no scientific research on the impacts of oil and gas exploration, especially seismic testing, on our oceans and fisheries. The limited research we do have suggests significant risks with caution to be applied. Minister, do you appreciate why commercial fishing bodies and stakeholders right around the country, from Ningaloo in Western Australia to the Great Australian Bight to King Island off Tasmania and to the Otway Basin, are up in arms over new offshore oil and gas exploration Order, acreage? Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, uh, I suspect Senator Wish Wilson uh, exaggerates somewhat uh, what he describes as, uh, as those who are up in arms. Uh, but I again restate as I did in the primary question in the first supplementary, uh, that when it comes to any applications for uh, seismic testing, uh, offshore drilling, 
uh, any such activities, and they go through a very thorough assessment process. And that assessment process is designed uh, to ensure uh, that scientific evidence is heeded, uh, that safeguards are met, and indeed involves opportunities for communities, stakeholders or others to have their say as part of that assessment process and to present evidence to those assessments. That's precisely what, to what will occur in the case of any of the types of hypothetical circumstances that Senator Wish Wilson uh, raises. Uh, it will be done properly in a way that balances those interests, assesses the evidence, but also provides an opportunity still for job creation to occur in Australia where projects Order. meet the Senator appropriate Birmingham. safeguards. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. Yep, we're good to go. All right. My question is for the Minister for Order Aged Care. Order on my right. Hang on. I'm going to stop the clock. I don't. I was taking notes, and I don't know what happened there, but I'm going to. We're going to start again, so I can hear the question. Order on my right. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Former Prime Minister Abbott says elderly people with COVID-19 should be left to die, quote, while nature takes its course. Why hasn't the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians already condemned this heartless remark by this former Liberal Prime Minister? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I had not heard that comment made by a former minister, minister, Prime Minister. Order. But, Mr. President, uh, I do not agree with that. I do not agree with that. I, I, I do not agree with that statement, Mr. President. I simply do not agree with it. And, Mr. President, the government's actions demonstrate the, that our desire to ensure all of our actions demonstrate our desire to ensure that all senior Australians. COVID positive or not, COVID positive or not, are treated with respect and get the care that they deserve. Exactly. Mr. President, there is no way I think anyone in this chamber, on either side, Mr. President, would agree with those comments of former Prime Minister um, Abbott. Uh, absolutely, do not agree, uh, and uh, and I would I would condemn the comments, Mr. President, because uh, that's not what I believe. Uh, I don't think that's what anyone in the in the chamber believes, Mr. President. And uh, our desire is to ensure that all senior Australians, all our planning, all our work has been to ensure that all senior Australians uh, get the care that they deserve and they need, uh, regardless of the COVID-19 circumstances, Mr. President. Uh, so I, I simply do not agree with the statements of the former, former Prime Minister. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Mr. President, last month the Prime Minister Scott Morrison said the view that elderly people should be offered up to COVID-19 is, and I quote, an absolutely amoral, hideous thought. Does the minister agree that Tony Abbott's prepared remarks in his speech last night are amoral and hideous? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, I just condemned the remarks of the former Prime Minister with respect to Australians who have COVID-19, senior Australians or any Australian who has COVID-19. I do not agree with the remarks that were made last night. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. I note the minister's condemnation of Prime, former Prime Minister Abbott's remarks. Does the minister's dismissal of deaths as a, of, by neglect as a function of the aged care system reflect his view that elderly Australians should be offered up to COVID-19 and left to die while nature takes its course. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it is really quite offensive that Senator Keneally continues to misrepresent the remarks that I've made in the chamber. I have never, I have never done that. I have never dismissed any of the deaths. I have never dismissed any of the deaths, Mr. President. Uh, I have consistently offered my condolences to every family who has lost a family member with respect to uh, COVID-19, Mr. President, and the misrepresentation of my comments by the opposition on a number of occasions is dishonest, Mr. President, and, and it's offensive. Uh, all of the efforts of the government, all of the efforts of the government right through this pandemic, have been focused on providing support to senior Australians through the COVID-19 outbreak. We continue to do that. 
we continue to do that, Mr. President. Uh, and, and I find the comments and the suggestion of Senator Keneally quite offensive. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Can the minister outline the government's support to vulnerable Australians whose return to Australia has been impacted by COVID-19? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith uh, for his question. Uh, we're certainly aware, Mr. President, that many Australians are facing hardship overseas uh, because of the global travel restrictions resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Many Australians have been able to return more than 379,000 since the government advised Australians to reconsider their need to travel overseas. However, about 30,000 people are registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and to Trade as being overseas, and of those, about 20,000 have expressed a wish to return. The government, through its network of DFAT consular staff, has been helping those Australians with a focus on people who are most vulnerable because they have no means to support themselves or perhaps have medical conditions. Today, the government has indicated that we will provide further support through an expanded hardship program, which will build on our existing Traveller Emergency Loans program. These are one-off loans which will be available to cover emergency living costs <laughs> until a person is able to return. Loans will also be available to help with the cost of airline tickets to return to Australia. Loans will be made to the most vulnerable Australians, and applicants will need to meet strict eligibility requirements, including, for instance, being able to show that they have attempted to return to Australia. This financial assistance is available to Australians, much like the traveller emergency loans, as a last resort. Uh, for further information, Mr. President, we of course continue to encourage people to visit smarttraveller.gov.com.au. Uh, Mr. President, we do understand that uh, many Australians have found themselves in difficult circumstances resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, travel restrictions globally, as I said. The program we are announcing today will alleviate some of this hardship. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise what steps the government has taken to protect the health of the Australian community, including those Australians overseas? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for his supplementary question. The government did act early uh, to slow the spread of COVID-19 in, in Australia by recognising this as a pandemic and restricting entry to the country. Without these measures, taken based on clear health advice, the pandemic would have hit our communities much harder. Around 4,000 Australians continue to return each week. The states and the territories' incoming passenger caps remain in place through the National Cabinet process to protect the Australian community, though, as the Prime Minister has advised, they are uh, being regularly reviewed. The situation in Victoria has illustrated how dangerous a compromised quarantine system can be. Today's national accounts data also underscore the fact that, as well as the tragic loss of life, the economic damage is unparalleled in our recent history. We acknowledge that domestic caps are making it harder for people to return, but we do ask that Australians understand that there is a balance Order. which has Senator to be Payne. struck in Senator these circumstances. Smith. Final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate what further support and guidance the government is giving to Australians overseas and their families? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think it is important to note that this is a global pandemic which is far from over. There is no guarantee about when international travel, for, travel, for example, will return to some form of normalcy. DFAT continues to work with airlines and other governments to assist Australians in returning, but it is going to be some time before flights are available. And in that context, we encourage Australians seeking to return to stay in close contact with their airlines their travel agents to confirm plans as they are uh, able to do so. For those who are unable to obtain flights, we continue to encourage them to ensure they have arrangements in place to allow for a possible extended stay. The support announced by the government today is designed to help the most vulnerable Australians overseas to maintain those arrangements. Australians overseas are also able to follow the advice of local authorities, of course, and continue to monitor the government's advice on Smart Traveller. Order. Senator Payne. Senator Green. 
President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Australians are living through the worst recession since the Great Depression almost a century ago. Today's national accounts show household spending has collapsed and we have a record high unemployment, with one million Australians out of work and 400,000 more expected to lose their job by Christmas. Isn't this the worst time to be cutting back support? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Green uh, for her question. Well, quite clearly today, the, the figures that, that we received um, indicate the devastating impact that the COVID pandemic has had on Australia, on our economy, but most particularly on the lives and livelihoods of many Australians. Uh, and that is why this government has put in place an unprecedented package of supports for Australians. Um, uh, $314 billion have been put into the economy to make, sure, uh, to make sure that Australians have got a cushion by which to, to support them through this, uh, this uh, un unprecedented um, uh, pandemic that has hit the entire world but has also impacted Australia. But what we did say at, uh, at the time this pandemic first hit, back in March, and everybody here was in the chamber at the time, was that we needed to put in supports to assist Australians from one side of this pandemic to the other. Clearly, we are not through that pandemic yet. But we all agreed at the time that we would put in place supports, and in my area of social services, those supports related uh, to the coronavirus supplement. Um, we made a decision in July, we announced to people in July, that we were going to extend that support past the end of September, because we recognise that Australians are still doing it tough. But, but across much of the economy, we are starting to see the green shoots of our economies opening up. We are starting to see, we are starting to see jobs occur. And it is the responsibility of a, a responsible government to make sure that we manage the balance between providing increased levels and, of, of support to support people in a shallow job market, but at the same time recognising we have to put the incentives back in place so people start engaging with the job market so that they can start getting themselves back into the job market. Order. And in addition to that, we also provided assistance through the, in, for, uh, the income free Order, area. Senator Rustin. Time for the answers expired. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In, Order. in March, the Senate gave the minister extraordinary powers to increase support to those on support payments. What is the economic impact of the minister's refusal to use her extraordinary powers to give the one million Australians without, without work the support that they need? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and I would point out to Senator Green that um, I have actually used my powers. There is a, uh, an instrument uh, laid in this place at the moment to extend the coronavirus supplement from the end of September till the end of December, recognising that the jobs market is still very shallow. But we, in addition, we do want people to start re-engaging with the, the jobs market because we understand we understand um, that people who are um, in, in have any form of income in addition to their unemployment benefit are more likely to come off, uh, off payment. Um, but I find it really quite extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's almost like um, you, know, you guys want order. to have an each way Senator, bet. Uh, Senator Rustin, Senator Watt, on a point of order? On, on relevance, the question was asking the minister what the economic impact of her refusing to use her powers is, and she hasn't addressed that point. Um, well, the minister has been addressing the use of the powers, she is, and that was directly relevant. I'm listening to what the minister is saying, and I, I consider it to be relevant to the question, um, referring to both the powers and the economic impact, which phrase is used in it. Senator Rustin. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, as I was saying, you know, it's almost like those opposite want to have an each way bet. I mean, in one instance, you're telling us that we need to extend things, and the other side, you're telling us to transition out of it. Um, so, I mean, clearly, those on the other side really don't actually know what you Order. want. Senator. Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance, Mr. President. Um, after after the point of order there was raised, the minister then went to a commentary on the Labor Party. They're in government. They asked the questions. And they, they answer the questions. I'd ask you to, to ask the minister to return to the question. It would be easier if there were no interjections and ministers did not take them. That would be easier. Um, the minister has five seconds left. I'll encourage her to be directly relevant and there to be no interjections to provide her with bait. Otherwise. Thank you very much. I have used my powers. 
Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Why is the minister not only refusing to act but also cutting back support from the economy and the jobs market, making it even harder for the one million Australians out of work right now to find jobs and to put food on their table? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And as I said to the answer to the primary question that I received from Senator, Senator Green, um, everybody in this chamber was in the chamber in March when we made a decision to put in place a supplement called the Coronavirus Supplement for a period of six months. That period of six months expires on the 24th of September this year. The decision of this government, the government of which I am the Social Services Minister, made a decision which he announced in the July economic financial update was that the decision of this government was to extend the supplement past the September deadline until December and at the same time put in place an increased income free area which allowed people to earn an additional $300 before any of their payments were cut back. Order. In effect, we have said we are transitioning people back into the economy but we recognise the job market is shallow and for that reason we have extended the supplement for a further three months at the same time as putting an income-free area Order. Senator Cormann. Uh, I uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Gallagher. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Cormann to the question asked by Senator Wong. Uh, and I thank the Senate. So, uh, well, today we've had the national accounts uh, released. And what they've shown is we have the deepest recession since the Great Depression. We've got the worst quarterly contraction since records began 60 years ago. Household spending has collapsed. Business investment, already in decline since 2018, tanked. A million Australians unemployed, 400,000 people expected to lose their jobs by Christmas, 1.6 million Australians receiving income support through Job, Keep, Job Seeker or Youth Allowance, about 3.5 million Australian workers on JobKeeper, record levels of debt, deficits for a decade. And what's this government's response to this disastrous set of numbers released today? Numbers which behind them tell the distressing stories of businesses lost, jobs lost, households under enormous stress. And what is the government's response? Where is their plan for economic recovery? Where is their plan for jobs? We've known for some time the Treasurer is very quick to go out and tell everybody how bad the economy is, how terrible the impact of COVID-19 has been, but he's not as quick to get out and tell us what the plan is in recovery. And that's what people want to hear. They know the economy's um, suffered. They know jobs have been lost. Each one of us knows someone who's lost their job, who's struggled to make ends meet. We all understand that. The more relevant thing for the government to be focusing on is what are they doing? And the only thing they've been clear about in the last since July, uh, when they updated the uh, economic update, the only thing they've been clear about is a plan to cut economic support, to cut JobKeeper, to cut JobSeeker, to cut wages, to cut super, to freeze the pension. They're all decisions that this government's taken. So we know what they're prepared to cut, what they're prepared to withdraw. It's less clear to us about what they're going to do to drive economic growth to drive jobs growth, to support businesses that are under pressure in the recovery stage. And that's what we are looking for, and that's why we asked our questions today. That's why we want to know, is this the right time for the government to be withdrawing the support that's been provided in the last six months? And it's not just Labor. The Reserve Bank governor has made it clear on many occasions that fiscal policy will remain an extremely important element of any economic recovery. And he has warned against withdrawing fiscal support too soon, because the consequences of that will be a longer and deeper recession, and the unemployment queues will uh, grow longer than they should have or needed to grow if the government gets this wrong. 
And that's the point that Labor is making. And that's why we are asking the government, what is your plan for jobs? How are you going to grow jobs and grow the economy? Um, because that is what Australians expect of their government. That's what they elect them to do. Not to tell them how bad everything is and how it's not their fault. It's all everybody else's fault, the state's fault, or we're better than uh, every other country. Well, when you do those international comparisons, I think it's pretty cold comfort, frankly, for the million people who have uh, joined the unemployment queues or the 1.6 million who are surviving fortnight to fortnight on Job Seeker or Youth Allowance. I don't think they really make the international comparison. They want to know what the plan is for jobs. And we know this government puts a lot of emphasis on the spin. There's a lot less evidence, uh, emphasis placed on the substance. So we have announcement after announcement, job maker, job trainer, home builder. And then when you drill down into those programs, programs announced 10 weeks ago, three months ago, what do you find out? You find out, well, there's under job maker, no idea how many jobs it'll create. The employment department didn't know what it was, other than they weren't in charge of it. Job trainer, don't really know what the skills priority list. I think they may have released something today, but 10 weeks ago or when it was announced, they didn't know. They had to wait for that work to be done. And home builder, sup supposed to drive the construction industry, no, nothing spent, no applications approved. Well, we want more than spin. We want substance and we want a jobs plan from Thank this you, government. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator Sussilja. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, and, you know, when we think back to the last election, uh, and we, I, I recall in the, in the week uh, before the election, I remember, I remember the Labor Party put out uh, their picture. Yeah, no, it's a good one. I've, I've got the picture. I've got the picture. It's a good one. It's in my office, and you're in it. Senator Wong. Senator Wong was in the picture. Uh, Mr Bowen was in the picture. Mr Shorten was in the picture. Mr Chalmers. And what they said is, Order. we're ready. They said, we're ready. And you Order. know, I think, I think about that election when I see what the Labor Party goes on about in opposition and the way they behave, and I think about the reasons for that. And there's a lot written about it, about how their economic plan, the wrecking ball they wanted to take to the Australian economy with their higher taxes plan. Uh, was, it, was it part of that? Yeah, it was. But you know what it goes to? And the line of questioning that we saw in question time today, which we're debating now, the questions uh, that they have put in and the answers that were given to those questions, the line of questioning fundamentally goes to the disdain that the Australian Labor Party has for the Australian people. They have absolute disdain for the Australian people. We saw it with the claims that you could raise taxes by $387 billion, and that would have no impact. That would have no impact. You'd just be able to get this magic money tree and distribute it wherever you liked, and that would have no impact on the economy. And now we see it in question time today and in the attacks that the Labor Party are launching, where they show such disdain for the Australian people and they think that they won't notice that when they attack us as we face this economic downturn uh, and they ignore what is going on around the world and what is going on in Australia in terms of this thing called COVID-19, coronavirus, and the hit and the wrecking ball that that has been for the world economy. And, and so we have you know, Labor senators interjecting uh, about this. They, 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 they seem to think that the Australian people are, are too dim-witted to, to notice uh, that there are these things going on and that governments around the world are seeking to deal with it. And this Australian government, this coalition government, has put forward policies uh, right throughout to shield Australians from the worst of the economic impact. Now, can we, can we stop any of the economic impact? No, unfortunately we can't. And that's why days like today, when we see those figures out there and we see a number put on, on the challenge and the suffering that so many Australians are going through as we deal with this health crisis and we deal with this economic crisis, when we put a number on it on days like today, they are tough days because we are thinking about those people who have lost their jobs. We are thinking about, well, you know, again, again, we get these ridiculous, ridiculous interjections. Uh, but the Labor Party would like us to pretend that, that this is all happening in a vacuum. 
that the, that the drop in GDP that has been announced order. today, that we take seriously, that we've been working Senator so Pratt, hard. Order. And as, as Minister Cormann pointed out, you know, when, when you have states and territories, and, and in most cases uh, doing a good job, doing a pretty good job in most cases, uh, seeking to deal with the health crisis and shutting things down and saying you can't move here and you can't move there and this business can't open, well, you know what? That has a serious impact on economic activity. But the other lie that the Labor Party seeks to perpetuate and thinks the Australian people are too stupid to notice is that somehow we went into this uh, with an economy that wasn't doing well. That's not what the RBA governor had to say. He was forecasting economic growth of 3 per cent and more going into 2020 and 2021. He was forecasting unemployment to drop below 5 per cent. So that was our starting point. That was the starting point that the Liberal National Government brought the country to. The other starting point we had was a balanced budget. Having, delivered, having, having inherited a $48 billion deficit from the Labor Party, we balanced the budget, which of course has given us more fiscal firepower to be able to support Australians with things like JobKeeper, with things like JobSeeker, providing balance sheet support. Can you imagine if the deficits that had been run up under the Labor Party had continued, as they would have? 40 and $50 billion deficits that were there. So we balanced the budget. We were strengthening our economy. Unemployment was headed below 5 per cent. And now we are dealing with this challenge together as a nation. And we will deal with it. We will come through this because we will, we will make the kind of changes. We will be nimble as, as an economy and as a, as a government and a country that will help people get back into work, that will assist them with the skills they need, that will cut the red tape that gets in their way. We will get out of this together, but we're not going to be lectured to from the Labor Party living Thank in a you, fantasy Senator land Sisselger, pretending your the crisis time has doesn't expired. exist. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, let's just start with a few facts. We'll make a nice change from what we just heard from Senator Sazelja. The facts are that today we learned Order. that Australia is facing its worst recession in nearly 100 years. The worst recession our country has faced since the Great Depression. We have seen the worst quarterly contraction of our company since records Order. began. If there's one thing that this government has set a record for, it's for setting new records about its poor economic management. Even before this crisis hit, we saw the worst wage growth that this country had ever seen, the worst wage growth since records began. And today, we see the worst contraction in the economy in any one quarter since records began. It's the first recession in 30 years, 30 years, when growth started under a Labor government, got the economy moving, got the economy growing, got people into jobs under a Labor government, and it's all been brought to an end by a coalition government starving the economy and starving the Australian people of support that is desperately needed. Now, I might just point out that the government is very keen, as it wants to do, to, to flick responsibility for what's gone on here, it points to the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, and of course that, of course, of course that is a factor in this economy. But I didn't see anyone in the government benches running those kind of excuses when Australia faced the GFC. All around the world, after the GFC, the, econ the global economy went into freefall. All developed economies went into recession for years, except for one. Australia. Australia was the only world economy that did not go into recession after the GFC, and that was because of the policies that were brought in place by the Labor government of the day. And this government could take a few lessons from that Labor government about how you deal with external economic shocks and protect your own population from the harm that they can cause. Just as we saw a Labor government take an expansionary approach to the economy after the GFC, we need this government to take an expansionary approach to the economy after the COVID crisis. And unfortunately, we are seeing the opposite. Now, all of these facts and figures have human consequences. It's not just about percentages and records and things like that. It's about the human consequences. All around Australia, we're seeing families losing jobs, unable to pay bills. We're seeing businesses that have been developed over decades collapsing. 
and we're seeing Centrelink queues the like of which we have not seen since the Great Depression. These are the human consequences of this government's failure to properly protect Australians from the COVID epidemic and its economic consequences. What's even worse is that rather than protecting the Australian people, this government's policy decisions are actually making things worse. They are making this recession be deeper and last longer than it needs to, and they are holding the recovery back. I mean, we just heard this nonsense from Senator Rustin that we're now seeing green shoots in the economy. On the day we plunge into the first recession we've had in 30 years, that's, great. that's green shoots? I'd hate to see a dry lawn if that's green shoots. This economy is in freefall under this government, and they're making it worse from their own decisions. They excluded casuals from receiving JobKeeper. They excluded all sorts of other people from receiving JobKeeper. They've set up a system where people are having to raid their own superannuation funds just to stay afloat because not enough support is being provided by this government. And now, at the time, the same week that we hear, we're seeing the worst recession in Australia for 100 years. They plunge on with their, their plan to cut JobKeeper, to cut JobSeeker, to freeze the pension and to cut the planned superannuation increases. So their own policies are making this worse and are holding back the recovery. What the government should be doing is coming out with some kind of a jobs plan. I mean, I was challenging the government through question time as to where their jobs plan is. It's a blank sheet of paper. It doesn't have a website. It's www.nojobsplan.com. Thank you, Senator Watt. Get Your time with it. has expired. Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I, there are a number of uh, matters which separate one side of the chamber from the other. The most critical uh, at this moment seems to be that on this side of the chamber, most, if not all, of our members can manage to stay awake for the entire course of parliament. But of course, we know that's not true on the flip side of parliament because we've seen Senator Carr nod off. But it seems to me that there are many, many more who may well be Senator Wong. I know that this doesn't relate to you. Um, we're talking about Senator Carr's napping off yesterday, but he's been asleep for longer than we think, as obviously has. Senator Watt, because uh, oh, what we Senator have. Senator Antic, what, what please resume your seat. Senator Polly. Yes, uh, Deputy President, I draw your attention to the issue before the chair and draw the good senator to the topic at hand. It's not one to run a commentary on other senators. Thank you, uh, Senator Polly. I am listening carefully and I'm waiting for Senator Antic to um, take note of the. Uh, questions and answers from Senator Cormann. You, Madam Acting Deputy President, we are now uh, something in the order of 25 seconds in, so not an unreasonable prelude because the point I was going to make uh, was that you would have to almost be asleep for the better part of 12 months to not know that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and obviously that, that propensity to, to doze off has infected this side of the chamber because um, we all know on this side of the chamber that COVID-19 uh, has indeed been an uh, unprecedented event in our lifetime. It has been a wrecking ball through the economy. And in fact, we heard earlier from um, uh, Senator Watt that uh, there were concerns about the suggestion that we were now seeing green shoots. Well, let me take you to the words of the RBA governor, who said in relation to the situation Australia finds itself in um, yesterday, as difficult as this is, the downturn is not as severe as earlier expected, and a recovery is now underway in most of Australia. Now, we know this side of the chamber loves evidence-based politics. We hear it all the time, evidence-based policy, evidence-based politics. This is the RBA governor saying this. Th so we, we know this is a difficult time. We on this side of the chamber know this is a difficult period. We have seen COVID-19 do what no other incident has done in our lifetime. And the IMF is actually expecting 157 economies to contract this year, and many uh, would be unprecedented falls. So the impact in the June quarter of GDP across the globe has been staggering. No other way of putting it, staggering. So let's take through some, some more evidence-based uh, uh, assessments here for the other side. 20.4 per cent GDP fall in the United Kingdom. 
13.8 per cent in France, 11.5 per cent in Canada, 10.1 per cent uh, in uh, uh, sorry, 9.1 per cent in the United States. Th these are ostensibly the biggest economies in the world. Th the situation in Australia needs to be read as per the facts show, and the RBA governor's comments are very, very relevant. And while the market is expecting falls less than what we've seen overseas, the national accounts will confirm uh, what Australians already know, that the economy has been hit hard. That is very, very, very clear. And we can't rule out, of course, the impact of uh, the uh, effect of the Victorian stage four lockdowns. This has been an enormous drain on the economy, of course, coming from the Labor-run state of Victoria. And as part of our economic plan, the Morrison government is providing unprecedented support. The suggestion that there has been no support or that JobKeeper is being wound down unnecessarily is an absolute nonsense. It's a, it's a Labor-run furphy. The, business, the, the 30, $314 billion in support to keep businesses and Australian businesses in jobs. And, uh, we, can, we can run through some of those. Our jobs plan is, without question, uh, sound and fundamental. We have the economic support packages. Well, I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give. Uh, I'm going to give Senator O'Neill some more evidence. I'm going to Order. give her some more evidence because we know she, being a Labor senator, loves evidence-based policy. Our economic support package of $305 billion represents. Fifth, no question. She's she's awake. That's good. 15.3% uh, of annual GDP. Now let's take it through. We need to break these down because some people are asleep at the wheel in this chamber. $101.3 billion for JobKeeper, Madam Acting Deputy President. $101.3 billion. $31.9 billion for cash flow boost for business. Senator O'Neill. $16.8 billion for income support for individuals, including the $550 fortnightly coronavirus supplement. $9.4 billion for two rounds of the uh, stimulus payments. Um, then there's the Skills and Apprentices pro uh, Apprenticeship Program with the national new, new National Skills Commission, which we've, we've spoke about at length in here. This is going to help young job keepers to better understand the skills needed of employers. I mean, this government really, what, what, what more can this government do? This is, what, what, once again, for those Order. who are awake on the opposite side of the chamber, which Senator O'Neill very clearly is, Order. Must, Senator Carr's gone off for a nap, I think. Um, in the meantime, we are going through the continual list of continual list uh, of thank achievements. Thank you, Senator Antic. Your um, time has expired. And may I remind you of the words uh, of the president earlier in the week about not referring at this particular time to senators who are not in the chamber because we have so many senators paired and using the video link. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Well, that, that uh, contribution to our debate after question time was an embarrassment for a government that has no plan. The only plans that were referenced there at all was the announcement schedule, where the government goes out and makes an announcement day after day, but Australians are starting to wake up to this government. They are desperate to hear. They are desperate to hear that the government have a plan because they know it's affecting their life. But there is no plan. I rise, like my colleagues, to take note of answers made by the Minister for Finance regarding this truly, truly terrible day for the Australian people impacted by what's going on in our economy. Now, as was forecast in recent days, the Australian economy has headed into a recession for the first time in nearly three decades. The jobs figures are more diabolical than even I feared, with another 400,000 Australians predicted to lose their jobs by Christmas. This is indeed, as Senator Watt said, the worst recession in nearly 100 years. And memories and images that echo those of the Great Depression are acquiring a 2020 makeover in the lives of our citizenry right now. So many Australians, far too many Australians, including my own children and their friends, have in their sights now a recession. They have no idea what it's like—30 years of growth constructed by great policy making by Labor leaders, kicked off with Hawke and Keating. But right now, we are witnessing 
Our children are witnessing the long, long queues outside Centrelink right across this country. They're driving down Main Street seeing small businesses shuttered right across the country. They're coming to know and see the Australians who they believed would always have a job, not have a job, businesses disappearing overnight. Today, it's been confirmed that the GDP, the gross domestic product of this country, has collapsed by 7 per cent through the June quarter. That figure of a 7 per cent decline in the wealth of our nation is unheard of since the Great Depression, over 90 years ago. The pandemic has indeed caused a steep drop in private household expenditure, and that has had massive economic impacts. And I will go to what Senator um, Cormann said that was of incredible concern to me. He said, yes, that private household expenditure has dropped. He said, people have stopped going out to restaurants. They're not going to cafes. As if that's all that's wrong with the economy. If that's all that Senator Cormann thinks is wrong with the economy, where we have a 7 per cent contraction in GDP, then we're in for some bumpy times. But I tell you what he gave away today was he predicted what the next steps in the government's response were going to be. Watch out for these words, adjust, new normal and a new baseline, because that's what Senator Cormann said today that this is the new world. We're going to have to adjust to a new kind of Australia. And when he says that you need to adjust, he's saying to my children and their friends and people who have lost their jobs, the million of Australians who've lost their jobs, the 400,000 people who are set to lose their jobs before Christmas, what he's saying is get used to it. Get used to it. The Liberal National Party the government of Australia, the one that goes out and tells you they're all about jobs and growth, well, they've got a new normal coming your way. They herald it today. Get ready for the adjustment. Get ready for the new normal. Get ready for the new baseline where you, people you care about in your family, are unemployed for a long time. And just to get you ready for that, we had Senator Rustin indicating that even though she has the powers, she's been given those powers by delegation, by legislation that went through this chamber and the other place earlier this year, she's been given powers to set the amount of money that is going to give, be given to Australians. She gave no hope, no heart, no sucker to the troubled, the troubled world of Australians you, Senator, who are trying to balance has their expired. books. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response by Minister Birmingham to my question on early childhood education. And after that, Senator Wish Wilson will take note of the response to Minister Birmingham's um, quest, uh, question to PP11 and Offshore Drilling. Um, today is Early Childhood Educators Day, but I don't think it's that happy a day for the educators. The United Workers Union, representing early childhood educators, came to Parliament today to meet with the Education Minister and deliver to the Education Minister a petition signed by more than 30,000 people. The petition calls for the federal government to provide a wage guarantee to workers in early childhood education and care through COVID-19. The union says that the employment guarantee provided by the government doesn't prevent part-time staff and casuals from facing drastic cuts in hours. The vast majority of the sector is part-time or casual. There is no safety net. The government must commit to a wage guarantee for our critical early childhood educators and carers. Just this week, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, identified an overhaul of early learning as a key priority to supporting Australian women and for gender equality. Recent research from the ANU Menzies Centre for Health Governance and the Grattan Institute has also revealed the huge social and economic benefits of public investment to slash the cost of early learning, particularly for women. But after a brief reprieve with free childcare, 
Most families are now back to paying expensive fees in the middle of a pandemic and a recession, when people are doing it incredibly tough. The government is dragging its heels and refusing to commit to making our childcare system universally accessible. What we need is free early learning for every child and every family. What we need is proper funding so that educators can be fairly compensated for the essential work that they do. I urge this government to make sure that early childhood and education is universally accessible to every single family and that it is fee-free. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. Australia truly is a nation girthed by sea. Most of our people, most of our populations live on or near our coastlines. Australians love our beaches. We love our coastlines. It's such an important part of our culture. And Australians know that this government is out of touch if they continue to push ahead with risky offshore oil and gas drilling. Now, I asked Senator Birmingham why the member for McKellar, Mr Falinski, moved a motion in the House last week opposing offshore oil and gas drilling off the central coast in New South Wales. The reason he opposed is the PEP 11 licence renewal. The reason he moved that motion is because thousands of people in his electorate are rising up and getting in touch with him and saying, this is just madness. In a time of a climate emergency, why are you risking our oceans? Why are you releasing new acreage? Why are you letting a few profit-driven put our lifestyle at risk? We don't want to see seismic testing off our coastlines. We don't want to see oil and gas drilling. We don't want to see controversial, divisive industrial development when we go to the beach. And it's not just off Central Coast in New South Wales. We've seen tens of thousands of people right around the country before the last election paddle out at oceans and beaches around this country to say no to new drilling in the Great Australian Bight. And I asked Senator Birmingham also about the fishing industry. Well, he might think that I'm exaggerating when I tell him that the fishing industry in this country is up in arms about new acreage being issued for seismic testing and oil and gas drilling. But let me tell you what we discovered in our last hearing at our Senate inquiry into risky seismic testing. We heard that Tasmanian fishermen, commercial fishermen, were so desperate to stop this oil and gas drilling and this seismic testing in their productive fishery that they were prepared to blockade seismic boats. They were prepared to put their own fishing boats and their own bodies on the line. Now, Senator Birmingham, that sounds pretty desperate to me. We've had submissions from your home state, from the tuna fishery. We've had submissions from the West Australian fishing industry, and we've heard evidence from the Victorian fishing industry already that they do not want to see more seismic testing in their fisheries. They're not happy with the process. They're not happy this is going ahead. Uh, you will be in for a rude shock if you don't listen to the Australian people on this most critical of issues. Order. Senator Wish Wilson, um, the question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day?